when a few of these bottlenecks kind of pile up, all of a sudden you've got music business systems that just aren't ready to take you to the level that you want to go. And they roadblock you. And uh, to be totally honest, I think we see more often than not, a lot of artists and bands really, really get stuck and they allow these small issues, which could be pretty easily solved to be their their ceiling. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice podcast. This is episode 233. I'm really excited to be here with you today. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me, as always, is your co-host, Mr. Ed Isola, who just returned from a tour with his band, The 502s. Ed, welcome back to sunny Orlando, my friend. How was the show? The shows were great, man. And uh, thank you for the welcome back. The shows were great, though. We went, we made it all the way up from Orlando up to Chicago and back. I think we did six or seven shows over the course of a week and a half, and they're all very, very sick. So feeling good and, and happy to be back and uh, chatting on Creative Juice. I'm excited for sure. Before we get into this week's episode and this topic, which I think is a really exciting one and definitely will be insightful to uh, any of our listeners that have been growing a fan base actively, uh, any lessons learned from the tour, anything you'd like to share? Huh. Put me on the spot. No, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's, if anything, the thing I've learned is just consistency. And, it, and really, we went out and we did more of the same, both from playing the show live and engaging with fans and marketing the shows. It was all stuff that we've talked about on on the deep dive we did last time, and we just did more of the same thing. But I'm finding more and more that that consistency and having that routine of, here's how we market the show, here's how here's what our set is, here's how we play the set, here's the moments in the set. As soon as that's done, everybody get to the merch stand. like, And then outside of that, like, hey, here's how we split up driving, here's how we do this, here's how we do that. Right? That kind of consistency and streamlining, I'm just learning more and more is, is really important, not only for touring, but just for everything in general when it comes to growth and having the right attitude and the right perspective and working as, as a team. The longer I get into the 502s, the more I realize like consistency and having good people around you are like the key things. So just kind of underlining that more and more on, on this past tour. That's a really interesting point to make, I think, right now especially given what we're going to talk about today that like you guys have your systems and your processes in place and really like refined and well, well oiled. And now it's just like, okay, do the consistent boring work. Like boring is better here. We don't need to deviate. We just need to do things the way that we know that they've been working and keep doing them well. And, you know, we'll see success. It sounds like that's a lot of what you're seeing compound over time. Yeah, for sure. And and I think like, unintentionally this does play into what we're going to get into today but i I think it's really interesting because that mindset is something that i think is without being like a life coach like great in life but if you're looking at specifically music it's like whether you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out what your first video is going to be or now you're touring and you're trying to figure it out well how do we do longer runs or how do we do more merch and that kind of thing it's just like the same idea behind if you're working out, I know we've said this before, if you're working out, like you're going to see better results if you show up for 90 days in a row versus doing like one really hard workout on the first day and then one really hard workout on the 30th day. It's like small effort, consistent effort is always better than like solely relying on a big push or like a big home run swing. Yeah, well said, well said. That does kind of dovetail really well into Uh, this week's topic for this episode, which is going to be all about consistency and getting through bottlenecks in your music business. And I think this is something that we see a lot of at IndieX when we work with artists who are of a, a scale where they have a large fan base. You know, there are really, I think you could boil it down to like two things. And we had an Instagram post on our IG that Cirque did specifically about this, that like there are really two two big umbrellas that artists need. It's like one, you need to be generating awareness. And two, once you have that, you need to be making offers to your fans. Everything else, uh, every other problem really exists under those two umbrellas. We'll link to that little uh, Instagram reel in the show notes so that you guys can check it out. It It was a nice little post from Cirque. But on that topic, 
one of the things that we see with a lot of artists who are of a sizable fan base uh, is that they have very specific bottlenecks when it comes to the offer creation process and the making of offers to their fans, whether those be free offers to try and grow their list, whether those be ongoing revenue generating offers for merch, and even things like offers to get people out to shows. There's a number of bottlenecks that kind of exist that I think a lot of artists face. And a lot of the work that we do at IndieX, being an agency that really focuses on revenue generation for artists uh, through e-commerce and merchandise is helping people unblock these bottlenecks pretty quickly. And the way that we do it is we really take a diagnostic approach to looking at these bottlenecks and asking the questions of where are you at currently and what do we need to do to solve these, you know, right now so that we can clear the path to getting you to grow to the next level. And there's a few areas where these bottlenecks exist. And that's what we wanted to sort of unpack on this episode and talk about kind of point by point, uh, the questions that we ask artists and their teams, and then the recommendations and sort of diagnostics and prescriptions that we make based on the answers that they have in hopes that if you're listening to this and you're at a place where you know you've got a, a fan base that's been growing and they're excited and they listen to your music and they're engaged with you, but you haven't quite maybe tapped a merch lever or you haven't pulled on trying to get your fans onto a one-to-one -one communication channel with you, whatever it might be, whatever bottleneck you might be facing in the larger subset of music marketing, hopefully looking at these kind of smaller areas will help you unblock yourself. So let's dig into it. What do you think, Ed? Yeah, let's do it. And, and I think what's cool about this is a lot of these things we're going to talk about oftentimes, in my opinion, aren't like big issues or big blockers that artists are facing. Like they're easily solvable. They're just artists let like five or six or seven of these things comp compound on top of each other. And then it becomes a problem of like, well, I can't do this because I need A, B, C, D, E. Yes, 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 exactly. So as we go through this, you, you're not going to hear anything that's like this monumental lift, but it's mostly like making sure you have every small little cog working. Yeah, that's really well said. It's definitely the compounding effect uh, that comes into place here. When a few of these bottlenecks kind of pile up, all of a sudden you've got music business systems that just aren't ready to take you to the level that you want to go. And they roadblock you. And uh, to be totally honest, I think we see more often than not, a lot of artists and bands really, really get stuck and they allow these small issues, which could be pretty easily solved to be their, their ceiling. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's really, as we dive in, that's really well said on your point too, where it's like, you have to have the right systems in place. And a lot of times you maybe don't know what the right system is, or you don't necessarily know what's missing or how to streamline that. And so having that right fluid system, that to me is like the number one thing that artists run into that stops them from growing. I feel like a lot of artists work very, very hard and knowing where to apply that effort and like say, hey, here's the problem. Here's what I need to do to actually fix it. That actually helps you progress as opposed to like, let me work really hard on this thing, but it's not actually serving my end goal. And so kind of going through this, hopefully we'll identify some of those end goals as you're growing that you need to have in place too, so that you know where, you, where to direct your effort. So that when you are working hard and you're spending your hours, like if you have a, a, a day job, like if you're if you're working that and then at night working on your band, making sure those hours you do have towards your music and towards your project are being spent effectively, not just working hard, essentially. Yeah, totally, totally. So let's dive into it. I think there are four main areas where these bottlenecks kind of exist and we can break them down. Like I said, this is one of the first things that we do when we work with an artist at the agency is we sit down with them and their team, usually at the end of our first week together, and we say, okay, We've got a sense of where your ecosystem is at. We know what we need to do. Now let's just make sure that you know these roadblocks are out of the way, or if they exist, we solve them right now so that it doesn't cause us problems down the line. And the areas where these exist are really in merch, fulfillment, offer strategy, and profit. Those are kind of like the, the four areas, and there's kind of some sub areas in between them, but they all kind of fall within those categories. At least that's my feeling. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, the first one you're talking about merch, it's like, I think there's two pieces to that. It's like 
the actual design aspect of it and then the where you're getting your merch printed. And so the first thing we kind of dive into with artists is like, what is your system for coming up with merch and getting your hands on that merchandise? Yeah, for sure. And I think something that's really important to consider here that gets lost very easily. This is one of the biggest challenges that we face as an agency that's like, how long is it going to take you to get your hands on a design? You know, is it going to be two days? Is it going to be a week? Is it going to be more than a week? And kind of setting a setting a realistic set of days, like a date range of like, man, if it's going to take you 14 days just to get a design back and then you still have to get it printed, that's going to take way too long in, in a number of cases to really get an offer out there unless we're planning really, really far out. So that's one of the one of the big things that we look at when it comes to design. Not that we're trying to hurry design professionals, but like a lot of times that's a big bottleneck that we find. So it's like, can you get design work done for merch in a speedy fashion? And also, do you have stuff on the backlog that we can use if you can't? Those kind of two questions, I think, work hand in hand together. Yeah. And this makes sense, right? Because it's like, if we're talking about the fact that what's the first thing that bigger artists run into in terms of having an issue to sell to their customers, it's like, you got to have a product and you have to have enough stock of that product coming where what we've seen in NDX is like when, when clients come on and they're bigger and they have this audience and they show up with, Hey, I got a merch drop planned here and a merch drop plan there that's very easy for us to just go and make a lot of money for artists that have that fan base because they have the product. And so where it gets tricky, like Jack said, is if you're taking a long time and not on the ball, because sure, like you're not going to rush designers, you know, like you don't want them to feel like, Hey, I need this in two days, but you got to kind of really have that conversation or we have that conversation. And you kind of have to have that conversation internally with your team as you're planning this kind of stuff. Because if it is a long turn time, then you have to think about things much further out in advance so that you can say, hey, it's going to take us three weeks to get to the design. That's fine. But we need to start that, you know, three weeks normal earlier than we normally would. That really helps a lot for like back planning out everything that you need to do. And I think that's a really common problem in the music business as a whole is like the desire to have fast turnarounds for, you know, releases and promotion and marketing campaigns, but the inability to fulfill on that. Like, you know, how often have you and I seen like, we need to get this out there, you know, in three days. And it's like, okay, well, like, what's the design? Not sure yet. <laughs> like that is a, that is definitely a, that is a roadblock that I think rears its ugly head way more often than it needs to. There's this like thing in music and in, in the music industry, and it's probably not music industry specific, but I see it a lot in the music industry it's like this let's rush to get things done as opposed to like methodical kind of thing and i don't say that in, in necessarily a negative way but we see that so much it's like hey all right merch line's ready let's throw it out there like let's make it live and it's like well hold on why don't you like make sure you have everything and then let's put a plan together and roll it out and a lot of that i think is because people don't necessarily understand like there can be dedicated week long rollouts to merch lines and stuff like that, as opposed to just like merch lines ready, let's put it up on our store and hope people buy it. Um, so, but, it, but if you're looking at the merch, it's like, you know, sorting out from like a step-by-step -step process of like, okay, great. I need to get a design. I need to figure out where I'm getting my merch printed. That in itself is a longer process that I want to just like take a second about because it's not even as simple as, do you have a designer? Because that, that's helpful, right? If you know, hey, I got a designer, their turn time is two weeks, that's great. You also need to consider like, what's the design they're making, right? So like there's this ideation portion of like, what are the designs gonna be? Then you bring it to the designer and then they, they work on it, they turn it around and then they get it back to you. And so like phase one with a lot of these artists is like, phase one is like determining and designing the actual products. And that can be hard. So as much as you can kind of get people in place, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of artists aren't like in a place to have just hired employees that are in charge of these things, but as long as you can have your go-to people and some of that might fall on you to say like, well, let me spend a little bit of time brainstorming my ideas. And then 
let me go to my one of my two go-to designers to make this thing. Like giving yourself those avenues where you have a semblance of a team, that's really important to keeping this doable on like a, a repeatable process going forward. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, to for, for anyone listening who is in a place where, you know, maybe they don't have the, the largest audience, but a lot of this is resonating with them. And they're like, oh, man, like, I know that I've got this problem. But you're like, I can't hire a team or I'm not ready to hire a design agency or anything like that. There's a lot of resources out there for this kind of stuff. I mean, I know some of our clients who are on the still on the growing level where they're growing an audience, but they're also trying to monetize as they can. Even some of our larger clients that do have an audience that's really supporting them. Some of them use services like 99designs, um, and we'll link to that in the show notes. But there are some really good designers on there that work on contract and can you know get work shipped very quickly and do a really good job. So there are, you know, resources out there for that kind of thing, which I think is really important to note, you know, like you don't have to be at the pinnacle of the music industry or you don't have to be at like the the peak of your career and the biggest fan base in the world to to take something away from this. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point on the designs too because that's something that I feel like I've done for a very long time is it, it requires a little bit more work on I guess, you know, whoever's the managing partner of this aspect of your business. And and for me, oftentimes that was for the 502s, that oftentimes was me. But all that I found that that took was like me spending a few hours brainstorming what I wanted and then going on Fiverr or something like that and finding that design. So I think that that can build systems wise and over time help you streamline that kind of process. And real quick, before we move on from merch, I think the other part is like you get the design stuff down. There's obviously a lot of great resources online to work on that then you kind of start looking at the merch printing. And if I'm being honest, typically there's a local source that you can use to print your merch and and just getting that conversation and that relationship going has been the thing that I found works the best. Yeah, for sure. That's a really good point. Like it doesn't have to just exist in the online space. That's a really, really good point. Actually, like we have a number of resources at the agency that we even have in that sphere for fulfillment as well. You know, if you're not ready to hire out a, a full fulfillment team, you know, working with local help is something that is really, really valuable. I know you guys have a lot of experience with that too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something fulfillment wise that like we're just now switching. Jack and I actually earlier today did a call with the, the team we're going to be working with for fulfillment for the 502s. But before that, it's it was for about three to three and a half years, it was, we found a local t-shirt company and local CD printing company. We had our CDs and our t-shirts printed there. You know, naturally over that course of that time, you build a relationship with them. And it's not like we had new designs every week. So they kind of had our orders and our items and stuff where we could got, got to the point where we could email and say, hey, you know, what's up? I need a hundred of this shirt. And they would print them, we'd pick them up, good pricing. Like we did some pricing and and some comparing there, but that was what our merch system looked like. And myself and our bass player and our drummer at different points of those three years, we had our merch boxes in our apartments, whoever had space and we'd go over and we'd package together. And it was very much like, hey, there's orders coming in, but there's not so much coming in that it makes sense for us to outsource to somebody. And also financially, like that's, that's something early on, I feel like that's worth noting here with fulfillment is like, as long as you can hold on to your stuff, that's solid because when you go to a a company, now you're paying them per order or you're paying them typically like 15 or 20% of the merch. And as a grassroots artist, that is, you know, that that could be good money if you do $1,000 in sales and you gotta pay out 20%, right? Like, so we started there and then we transitioned into like, hey, okay, we're touring now. We don't really have the time to do that. We hired a friend. And at $15 an hour, we're just like, we need this. Here's the systems. We did an SOP. Very simple. And that worked great for a year and a half. And now we're at a point where it's like, well, now we need a company to handle this for us, both creating designs and everything that we've kind of talked about so far, streamlining that. But that's five, six years into the process, right? Where like we became the masters of finding designs, working with designers, clearly articulating what we wanted doing our own fulfillment. We know how to handle these things now. And it's working really great with this fulfillment company because we can jump on the phone and say, we need A, B, and C from you. And then they know. And they're like, great, we can do that. Like, let's do it. 
that kind of thing. And so I think my comment really around fulfillment is like, probably it's almost best to not just jump into working with a company. It's best to understand the different aspects of it. And then over time, you'll reach that. And if you're a bigger artist, obviously, you probably already have a merch fulfillment company and that's kind of sorted out. But if you're listening to this, like Jack said, and you're, and you're starting to work on it, that's OK to not immediately launch into I have a designer and a fulfillment team lined up. Yeah, I think that's a, honestly a perfect segue into talking about fulfillment at large and some of the questions that we ask, because it again, fulfillment like merch printing and merch design can be a, a pretty big like bottleneck when it compounds with these other elements. So yeah, some of the questions that we ask artists is like, do you have a team that's handling fulfillment or are you going to scramble if we start bringing in sales? Because you don't necessarily think about that. We've talked about this before on the show for sure, that like those first, you know, (laughs) if you're just starting out, those first seven or 10 orders, like you might think nothing of it until they're there. And then it's like, oh my gosh, I have to box up this stuff. I have to package these orders. I have to sign these, you know, these bonus goodies that I'm, that I'm giving out along with the orders. Like it all of a sudden becomes a very, very real thing. And sometimes this goes overlooked. I think the reason that these bottlenecks can be so insidious is because they get overlooked until the time comes to where you actually need them, which is, you know, a a real shame because it, it, makes people lose out on a lot of opportunity. So that's one of the questions that we ask first is like, do you have a fulfillment team or have you been handling it yourself? Sometimes that, (laughs) sometimes the answer is like a scratch of the head and I'm not really sure. But once we ask that and kind of get some clarity is like, okay, well, if you are working with a team, what does that cost you per order? That helps us think about like how we need to price uh, sales offers. We talk about warehousing costs, you know, what is it, what does it look like for you to stock your warehouse? What's the turnaround time look like? Do we know that we're gonna have happy customers because of all of this? And this sort of allows us to address like the process of selling from the minute of the sale happening uh, and even beforehand, like setting the offer price, like I said, but also from the point of sale through the fulfillment side, uh, what's actually gonna go down and is it going to be a good experience for the customer? We talked about a lot of this on the episode where we talked about creating a dream come true for your customer experience. So I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes, but these are just a few of the kind of questions that we ask on the fulfillment front. Yeah, and I think what you're probably starting to get at this point is that it's like the opportunity for bigger artists is more revenue generation. It's often underutilized and The second piece of that is that like, this is a process. It's not just like throw a merch line up. It's like, get the designs, get the sourcing, figure out who's fulfilling it and making sure they're intentional about it and understanding what's their process for fulfillment. Because the last thing you want to have do is somebody orders something and it's shipped out a month later, right? Like there's this expectation around like I ordered and then unless it was very clearly stated to me that it's coming in a month it should be here in a week or so, like if not sooner. And then you think about other little things too. It's like just making sure all of that stuff is together and and the fact that like who's paying for the shipping, like making sure customers receive a shipping tracking link when they order. There's all those different kind of things that are conversations to have and those are the conversations that we have. And then I think to your point, Jack, what's really gets kind of, I would view merch design, printing and fulfillment as like the, legwork, if you will, right? Like that's the team, that's the sourcing, the printing, all that kind of stuff. Where I think it gets really exciting is when you start to look at, like you said, well, okay, how much is our profit margin? How much can we offer these products for? And what can we do to make this a cooler offer, but still maintain a good profit margin? I think that's where it gets really fun. And when you have those other pieces lined up, you can spend more time thinking about, well, let me not offer a vinyl. Let me offer a vinyl that has A, B, and C, which is cool. I just saw a vinyl online. I was doing some looking at a band that I like, and they had a web store exclusive vinyl cover that came with like a free sticker pack. And I was like, for $35 or something. And I was like, that is a sick offer that I would buy. Yeah, that's nice. Don't you love when you find cool offers in the wild from artists and bands? Like <laughs> it always makes me so happy. That's the new segment. Offers in the wild. I love that. We, yeah, we should totally put that down. <laughs> I love that. No, that's that's such a good point, dude. Like what we've talked about so far, fulfillment and design and printing, those are kind of like the legs that the marketing 
needs to stand on before it can even happen, before we can even start planning a marketing campaign and talking about offer strategy and how often to be making offers and looking at profit margin and planning out pricing, those things really need to be in place and they need to be in place well. So that's one of the first things that we really, or one of the reasons that we really touch on those first. But yeah, I agree with you. Like where things really start to get exciting here is when we can look at profit margin and when we can look at, you know, the health of a store and really start to feel out like when we put offers together, what are we going to be making off of these? How can we maximize profit? And we look at that from a number of angles at the agency when we work with artists, you know, depending on what it is they're selling, what kind of products are going to be included in the offers, you know, what kind of bonuses, how urgent or scarce it's going to be, all of that good stuff, you know, if it's happening as a part of a launch. But just generally speaking, you know, one of the things that we <laughs> that we kind of look at first and foremost, just to make it simple, is like, let's look at your average profit margin across your store. What is your average profit margin? You know, like, if you're in the like 50 to 60% average profit margin range, you're in a pretty good spot. Then we look at, you know, if we were to start doing any kind of discounting, you know, like say you were going to run a simple flash sale, like what are your discount ranges that would be appropriate that would put you in a decent spot? So, you know, we'd be asking like, what would your profit margin be if you were looking at a 10% discount? What would your profit margin be if you were looking at a 20% discount, a 30% discount, so on and so forth? Just to really tease out exactly what we can be doing. And that gives us a pretty good sense of where value needs to be added and where prices need to be raised. Because that's another thing that I think a lot of artists deal with is that they underprice themselves uh, when it comes to making sales offers. Yeah, absolutely. Um and I think that's a really good point too. They do often underprice themselves on it and you wanna make sure you're having a solid profit margin. And I think that the other thing that I always like to look at profit margins with is like, okay, it's costing me $7 to make this and I'm charging 30 for it. Why don't I add another free bonus that's cost me $1.50 to produce? And so like, not only are you making sure you're, you're pricing yourself well, but you can also have an understanding of like, can I increase the value of this offer by adding something else to it, but still keep the profit margin? So I always think that that's a cool way to look at it. And then you can kind of just play with it too. Like you said, you can look at a 10 or 20 or 30% discount type of thing, which I think is interesting. And I think that that profit margin analysis and that kind of stuff really actually feeds really nicely into like the last point, which is like, how are you offering your customers both frequency wise and I guess I would say unique offer wise, maybe that's the right phrasing, but really looking at like how many offers do you make your customers a year and what are you offering them? And is it cool enough for them to want to buy and also as much as you can individualize to them? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. There's kind of two, there's two elements to this. Like, can you produce enough offer ideas. And this is where you're probably starting to see how all of this kind of plays into itself. Like, can you create enough designs and can you print enough merch or can you, you know, can you put a number of offers together based on what you have to continuously make offers to your fans throughout the calendar year? Or do you need to look a little bit further into those processes and say like, okay, we, we really need to ramp this up a little bit if we want to, even something as simple as like, if we want to make a sales offer for a big product launch every quarter. Let's just say that like as the bare minimum, let's say you're doing one big product launch every quarter and you're trying to pull in sales that way. And then maybe you're peppering in some, some flash sales throughout the rest of the year. Maybe that's where you're doing the discounts kind of coinciding with these bigger launches. Can you actually achieve that? Those are the questions that we like to ask is like, how many times are you doing this every year? <laughs> a lot of times the answer is like one, maybe Black Friday or like maybe when I launch a record. And it's like, there's so much revenue being left on the table for a lot of artists that it's just like, okay, let's just help you increase that frequency a little bit and make the offers just a little bit cooler. Sometimes even using the products you already have and you can scoop up a lot, a lot of revenue. We, I mean, we've seen this time and time again. I think that's a really nice way to present it. And and I think that like a lot of bigger artists don't comprehend this. And, and I think that also that's reasonable or it's understandable why they don't, because unless you're like in the weeds looking at these numbers all the time, you wouldn't think about it. But like 
I get the sense from the accounts that we work on that a lot of artists view this as like the following, like in terms of offer habits, I'm announcing something or I'm releasing something, I should see a big spike in income. And that's true. Like if you're putting an album out, you should see a big spike in income. Where I think a lot of artists that are, are large artists don't consider this is like, this is actually really ties in closely to my earlier comments about consistency, which was unintentional on my part, but it's really a nice tie in there. But it's like, if you're doing the big spike moment for your merch, your album release or whatever, that's great. That'll make you $100,000. If you also sprinkle in dedicated offers throughout the year, you're probably making, depending on your size, another $100,000 for the year in revenue. And so the practice of being consistent and making these offers if for, for big artists, and obviously this translates very well to grassroots and smaller like affirmation level artists as well, the numbers won't be as high, but like you can really pull out a lot of revenue from customers because they're excited about it. Like if you're look if you're looking at this as like, hey, I got my album out, let me make this special offer. And then two months later, let me make this special offer. And then two months later, let me make this special offer. And then let me do Black Friday. And then let me do a Christmas offer. And then let me do this other offer at the start of the year. Like there's reasons to do this. And each time it's like, well, I just made $7,000 here. I just made $16,000 here. My album came out, I made 50,000. Like the summed up value of gross revenue that you'll make if you're consistent about it is probably 1.5 to two times higher than if you just rely on that that big swing type of thing. And we've seen that a lot for, for several big artists we work with at IndieX where it's exactly what I just described. Before they came on, they had great merch sales when it was an album launch or something like that. And it would be like spike to a crazy number and then plateau. And it wasn't just like, it wasn't like every month it was crazy recurring online sales. It was very, it would plateau very low. But what we've gotten the habit of doing is saying like, okay, you know, as often as they can essentially, which comes out to be about every six to eight weeks, give or take, maybe a little bit more, they drop a merch line. And every time they drop a merch line, we do the same thing. And every time it's $25,000 to $30,000 in revenue. And so what you're seeing is you get the 100K from the album launch, and then you get this additional 120 to 150K coming from throughout the year promos. And that pulls them up from $100,000 in revenue on the store to a quarter of a million. And we're working to even make that higher because they can make more sales offers, but it's just a really important kind of perspective shift when you consider offers of like, hey, the little consistent promos are just as important as the big ones because those add up at the end of the day. Yeah, that's so well said, man. I think like one of the biggest traps that we try to pull our artists and bands out of is like the roller coaster of revenue that sometimes occurs, like you said, when it's just like, okay, I launch a record or maybe I go on tour and like there's a big revenue spike there and then it crashes back down. These bottlenecks that we talked about clearing on this episode today are all focused on getting you in a place where you can put very simple processes in place to do consistent selling to your fan base in a way that makes sense to you, that is selling to the right people at the right time with the right offer. And you can do that consistently with you know, just a little bit of hard work and some creativity. And you can really make it a part of your creative process, honestly, as a as a smart musician and a, and a creative marketer. There's some really, really cool stuff that you can do to kind of bring those peaks and valleys closer together and pull in a lot more revenue in the process. It can really, really add up, which is great. And I want to stress here, like, the consistency is something I think that's really important to mention to get in the habit of early on. So for anyone listening that's you know growing your fan base and really maybe just thinking about making your first sales, getting that consistency in place is really important and understanding these processes and these bottlenecks early on can help you avoid them altogether. And I want to make mention that like, if you're in a place where you're just starting to think about making merch and selling to your fans, there's a new training that we released inside of Indie Pro called Make Merch That Fans Want. 
And I'll leave a link to Indie Pro in the show notes. You can sign up and check it out and you can go through that training and learn how to really dig into the heart of what your fans would want to buy from you so that you don't have to ask questions or be wondering whether this is going to work or not. And you can kind of take, you know, those first two pieces of these bottlenecks that we talked about, you know, the design, the printing, you can kind of cut the legs out from under those and you won't have to worry about those becoming a bottleneck. So I wanted to make mention of that for sure. So if you've ever wondered about how to work towards that, definitely check it out. But yeah, super well said, Ed, like getting off the roller coaster through this kind of consistency, I think is uh, really, really critical for artists that want to grow past just relying on like more passive revenue streams or, you know, roller coaster sort of tent pole events by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really important too. It's not this, it shouldn't be this roller coaster. That's a great way to say it. The last thing I want to just kind of add on the thought around the offerings is that like you you want to have reasons for offerings. You don't want to just offer things. And so I'm, I'm looking, I'm thinking about like, oh, well, what's worked in the past? It's like obviously an album release is a great reason to make an offer. Send an email that's 10% off your store. That's not a great offer. That's not a great, great reason to have an offer. Sending an email that says, hey, we've pulled 150 of our vinyls from our store and we've signed them. First come, first serve, come get them. That's a great offer. And making things that are great offers is so important because what it allows you to do is again, expand this whole thing out. And I'm sure we've talked about this before and we'll dive into it more in future episodes, but saying like, hey, we're, we've got 150 vinyl, you know, and we've signed them. Not only is that a great offer to your current people, it's a great offer to put on social media and say, next Monday, we're releasing 150 signed vinyl. If you want them, sign up to our email list and get emailed about them first. It plays into this holistic strategy. So trying to make cool, creative offers is just so important. And I feel like that's a place where artists have just been told, yeah, it's fine. Just do 10% off your store for Black Friday. And that's great. And it's like, that's actually a pretty lame offer. And it's just something where I think it's like such, such an underutilized area that just want to stress, like, it's cool to be unique with your offers is pretty much how I think about it. I agree. I agree for sure. We'll link back. I remember a few months ago, you and I had a conversation on the show about offer creation, which we really didn't even touch on in this episode. Like this was all the stuff. These are the questions to ask before you even get to create an offer. (laughs) Um, And we'll link in the show notes to that episode where we talk specifically about like the elements of creating a great offer. We talk about urgency. We talk about scarcity and all of the elements that really go into putting together a killer offer for your fans. So if you haven't heard that episode, we'll link back to it so you guys can dig into it in the show notes. But I hope that going through this kind of diagnostic process that we do at the agency with the artists that we work with to help them kind of unblock their bottlenecks will help you guys do the same in your own music businesses. And we're looking forward to talking about more of this on the show. This was a really, really fun episode. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much, Indies. We'll catch you guys next time on Creative Juice. If you dug this episode, please, please make sure you leave us a review. It really helps to get the show out there and to give signals to Apple and anywhere else that people listen to podcasts about the cool stuff that we're talking about on the show. And that way we can help more musicians like you. So dig into it. We'll catch you guys next time on Creative Juice. Peace out, Indies. Peace out.